Hello, welcome to the reading group for On Hannah Arendt. My name is Richard Saltoon, founder of Richard Saltoon Gallery in London. And today's event is organized in connection with the gallery's year long series of exhibitions inspired by Arendt's 1968 publication, Between Past and Future. The discussion today will focus on Arendt's seventh essay from the book entitled Truth and Politics. Truth and Politics is also the title of our current exhibition in the gallery featuring Alexandra Domanovich, Alan Sekula and Ulai. And this continues on in London until 22nd of January. We've developed these short virtual reading group sessions to explore Arendt's writings in more depth and have done so in partnership with the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. I'll shortly hand over to Roger Berkowitz, founder and director of the Hannah Arendt Center, but just a few words on today's special guest, Martin Jay. Uh, Martin is Professor of History Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he's also a member of the American Philosophical Society and was elected a member there in 2019. He's a well-renowned intellectual historian and most of his interests have focused on the Frankfurt School. He's published over 15 books, uh, the last one, Genesis and Validity, the Theory and Practice of Intellectual History, was published just two weeks ago by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, Roger, over to you. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We've been doing this all year during this uh, pandemic and um, you know, it's always fun to have a new community of people who are gathering together to, to think deeply, in this case, about art and politics through, through Hannah Arendt uh, and her book, Between Past and Future. Um, the essay we're going to, to be talking about and reading together today, led by Marty J, um, Truth and Politics, um, along with her sort of the, 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 a, a similar essay called Lying in Politics, um, you know, is, is one of those essays that has definitely found its moment today. Um, I think it's important to remember that these essays were written, you know, uh, 40 years ago. Um, and we often think that, oh my God, this idea of lying in politics and truthiness and loss of truth is, is something that's so modern. Um, and yet it has long history and, and it's important to, to think of that and, and remember that this is in something that's been building for a long time. It is part of a, um, a real, uh, you know, needs to be understood as not just uh, a flash in the pan, but is something that we have to deal with as a, a deep uh, uh, a challenge to modernity uh, in a certain way. And um, there's really very few people uh, almost no one I could think of that can lead us better through this essay than Martin Jay. Um, I, he is, in addition to uh, what um, Richard had just said, he's not only won the Berlin Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Berlin, but he's written a, a wonderful book called The Virtues of Mendacity on Lying in Politics. Um, uh, very much... Uh, engaged with and, and inspired by Hannah Arendt's uh, view and which starts with that, you know, lying, truth and politics don't go well together and that lying is part of politics. And so um, uh, I'm really thrilled to have uh, Marty here to, to lead us. He's gonna speak for about 20 minutes. Um, I'll ask him some questions. Our panel will get involved and then we'll bring you all in. Marty, take it away, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, thanks so much, Richard and Roger, for that generous introduction. It's an extraordinary pleasure to be here. First, let me compliment the gallery for the audacity and courage in trying to uh, show what uh, Arendt in this essay and her other essays in between past and future try to tries to tell. Uh, this essay in particular seems to me um, extraordinarily difficult to translate into visual terms, partly because itself is a uh, contested and uh, in many ways, even contradictory expression of Arendt's uh, attempt to make sense of uh, the extraordinarily vexed question of the relationship between uh, truth-telling uh, and uh, political uh, action. The essay might better be uh, titled Truth and or 
uh, politics, because it really deals not so much with the connection between them, uh, but uh, the alternative between them. Uh, and uh, then uh, in a kind of, I don't know if you want to call it dialectical way, undercuts uh, the idea that they are separate. So it's an essay that has a lot of what I would call internal dynamism. It doesn't settle into one fixed position. Uh, in fact, the interpretations of the essays, uh, of the essay, and uh, Roger mentioned the other one, Lying in Politics, the interpretations have gone in very different directions. So for example, uh, Hans Blumenberg in the recently published posthumous book called Rigorism of Truth has attacked uh, Hannah Arendt along with Sigmund Freud for believing that uh, basically truth needs to be told no matter the consequences. In other words, fiat veritas uh, periat mundus. Uh, and she of course introduces that issue. Uh, and he's argued that uh, she is wrong to have stressed uh, the truth in the Eichmann Jerusalem uh, debate uh, over the function of the myth of uh, the, uh, let's call it, uh, Jewish um, non-complicity uh, in the Holocaust. I mean, her argument about Jewish complicity through the councils was the most uh, contested fact that she introduces. He argues that she made a mistake in being so wedded to truth, uh, and that in the contest between truth and politics, she came out on the wrong side. Uh, there's also an essay by Jacques Derrida uh, called The History of the Lie of Prolegomenon, in which he concludes, after looking at Arendt very carefully, that she too ultimately uh, came out on the side of truth. He talks about the ultimate parousia of truth, a kind of final uh, emergence of truth, and he argues this is highly unlikely. Uh, so uh, they've read the essay as arguing for truth against, we might say, the mendacity of the political realm. In my own reading, uh, I've gone in the opposite direction. That is to say, I've argued that Basically, what we get out of the essay is a very uh, provocative notion of the realm of the political in which truth plays only a very marginal uh, role. And sometimes, in fact, uh, lying plays an even more prominent role. Now, it's possible to read uh, this essay uh, with uh, both conclusions uh, if you stress certain uh, positions that she takes and not others. Uh, the essay itself is an extraordinarily complex and volatile uh, semantic force field uh, in which a number of terms are introduced, which then become, uh, in a way, qualified by uh, uh, ways of uh, nuancing them or uh, set into motion by being positioned against their uh, uh, alleged antonyms. So to begin with truth, I mean, she obviously makes the distinction between rational truths and factual truths. Uh, and although she's unhappy with the idea of rational truths, she says she's going to use it, even though it's a, uh, in some ways a very uh, dubious uh, uh, category. She includes in it uh, logical truths, which are in a way a la Kant analytic truths, uh, as well as scientific truths, uh, which are uh, in a way in Kantian terms, synthetic truths. Uh, and then finally, she also includes uh, uh, mathematical truths uh, and uh, uh, even philosophical truths, which uh, have a slightly different valence. These are the rational truths. The opposite of rational, she argues, uh, are uh, errors and ignorance, especially when it comes to uh, philosophy. Uh, I, I'm sorry, when it comes to, uh, uh, to logic uh, and to science. When it comes to philosophy, the opposite uh, of a rational truth is uh, opinion. So here we get a very, uh, we might say, volatile force field of different semantic uh, uh, charges just uh, with rational truth. And then rational truth is itself pitted uh, against factual truth, uh, which has a more direct relationship to the political realm. But here too, there's a certain ambiguity. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, fact uh, is a word that um, comes from factum, the Latin word for to make. Uh, and it's associated with the idea of human uh, productivity. And she even says that at one point, that facts are made. And yet in the 17th century, as Mary Poovey and a lot of other people have shown, fact became uh, something else. It became something that was the case, became a settled uh, reality, became something that was stubborn, became something that was less made than found. And facts were uh, in some ways, um, uh, a kind of obstacle to the absolute human uh, creativity or imagination, which could uh, fabulate and create something which was fictional. 
It was fact versus fiction. Now, in the political realm, facts, Hannah Arendt argues, uh, exist in ways that they put a check on human, uh, we might call it willfulness, uh, whether it be through lying or through uh, simply willing things to be different, facts are uh, stubborn. And the, exa the example she gives are quite interesting. They're all basically historical examples. Uh, in her own uh, 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 book on Eichmann, she's of course talking about something, the Holocaust, which happened uh, some 20 plus years uh, before the Eichmann trial. Uh, when she raises the, uh, uh, the famous example of Clemence so saying that they may say anything about the First World War, but they're not going to say that Belgium uh, invaded Germany. Uh, she's also uh, essentially holding on to uh, the past facts, the historical facts, uh, which are stubborn, which can't be changed. And her argument is that in politics, uh, even though facts are related to opinions or related uh, to uh, some other aspects of the uh, political realm, they have a kind of stubborn uh, what we might call um, uh, irreducibility. Uh, they can't be uh, changed. And of course, in our current world of uh, fake news and uh, a kind of factual uh, uh, fantasizing, uh, this may seem very much in jeopardy. And so she holds on to that aspect of facts and sees them as both made, but also within the political realm. Now, in so doing, she then creates uh, an interesting, once again, force field with opinion. So facts and opinions are related, but not the same. One uh, draws opinions from facts, but opinions uh, go beyond facts. Uh, opinions are the stuff we might say of politics. And she contrasts opinions, uh, and this is uh, absolutely crucial, uh, with uh, the uh, rational truths of philosophy, science, uh, and so forth. Uh, because opinions are basically uh, uh, plural, whereas facts, uh, uh, whereas, I'm sorry, rational truths are singular. And the distinction between a singular truth and plural opinions is precisely what distinguishes uh, the non-political from the political, because the political is the realm uh, of uh, opinion, plurality, rhetoric, uncertainty, a, a realm in which uh, we uh, cannot have a forced consensus. And truth, she argues, has, uh, at least in rational forms, a despotic quality. Uh, so there is a, a kind of tendential, we might say, uh, antithesis between rational truth uh, and opinions. Uh, but then factual truth enters a kind of uh, no man's land in between those two. And factual truths are part of the political realm, she says at one point, uh, and yet they're also different uh, from opinions. They uh, have a quality of uh, something which is prior to opinions, which is then uh, basically uh, something that you can have an opinion about, but which ought not to be seen as uh, simply as volatile uh, and as subjective as opinions. Now, this is, I think, a very tempting uh, way to look at things, but there are problems with this very distinction. First of all, the idea of a fact is made, suggests that it can be unmade or made again. Second, the idea of a fact as something which is solid uh, fails to um, take account of the fact that, uh, the fact that facts uh, can be described as events under description. That is to say, they are linguistically mediated. A fact becomes a fact uh, when it is given a kind of legitimacy as something which is prior to subjective intervention, uh, prior to uh, post facto interpretation. But by that very act of designation, the performative act of saying this is a fact, there is always already a linguistic quality to it. In addition, facts become meaningful when they are situated in interpretive contexts, in contexts of meaning. Uh, they don't stand alone as uh, simple objects, but in a sense are given a kind of meaningfulness in the uh, political realm when they're situated in narrative, situated uh, in attempts to uh, give them some sort of sense in a larger uh, context. So even that fact of the Belgian uh, non-invasion uh, of, uh, uh, of Germany, uh, this is situated in the larger context of the origin of the First World War, which as any historian will tell you is still a subject uh, of enormous debate. 
so that uh, these facts, we might say, are never isolated, but are always already situated in larger contexts of opinion, which creates, in a way, an opening for what we might see as a version of the political. This is the opening that I try to go through in the verse of mendacity, in which politics is a realm which has basically uh, a non, uh, we might say, truth orientation. It's a realm basically of rhetoric, of opinion, uh, of meaning, and also, and this is something she doesn't really deal with, of values. That facts are important, however we interpret them, however we contextualize them. But politics is also the realm uh, of values, uh, the realm of something which cannot be reduced simply uh, to statements about what is the case or what was the case. And this is shown in what we might call uh, also the temporality of politics. In her understanding of facts, she's constantly referring back to facts which can't be changed. Uh, truth telling uh, in the political realm as inherently conservative, she even says, uh, you uh, tell the truth because you don't want to change something. Whereas lying uh, and uh, the opinions we might say that uh, lead to uh, uh, political action are involved uh, precisely with action, with change, with, uh, we might say, a temporality not of the past, but a temporality uh, of the future. And so politics, to a great extent, involves, uh, in addition to interpreting the past and making sense of what has been and trying to rectify or preserve what has been, also a promise of what could be. And politics often involves uh, a sense of uh, looking forward to changing something which will, in fact, be uh, you know, possible in the future. It is the realm, we might say, not simply of remembrance, not simply of verifying the, what is the case, but also of trying to come up with solutions to or ways of being in the world which uh, differ from uh, the, uh, the past. And so to this extent, politics is, I would say, not totally unmoored from facts, but the center of gravity of politics is not factual. The center of gravity of politics is uh, aspiration, uh, is dream about what could be. And in French, uh, the word mensonge has within it the word songe or dream. Uh, and there's a way in which lying, as Arendt uh, tells us, uh, is a source of potential counterfactual action in the world, and therefore can be part of, we might say, the hope for a different world. Now, this is what we, if uh, you know, we take it to an extreme, could say is the uh, the uh, healthy relationship between lying uh, and politics. But Arendt also tells us, and I think here she's uh, you know uh, very much a uh, uh, prescient figure that there is a tremendous danger uh, in extending. Uh, this connection to the point where politics is nothing but fabulation, nothing but uh, hypocrisy, nothing but lying. Now she recognizes, and she even says this in On Revolution, that the French Revolution became terroristic when it sought to root out hypocrisy, that uh, the campaign a la Rose-Pierre against hypocrisy led ultimately to the coercion of the terror. But having said that, she also recognizes that politics must be based on a recognition that hypocrisy and lying uh, is a default, uh, or, or rather is a marginal uh, 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 parasitic position on the default position, which is truth telling. But uh, politicians can only lie if there is a presumption that they are telling the truth, which must be the dominant position. And when this distinction is lost, the, lo the, lo the distinction between telling the truth uh, and uh, prevaricating or being hypocritical, then we're in danger of a politics which creates not lots of little lies, but the big lie, the lie in which uh, we lose the distinction uh, between uh, facts and uh, fiction, between uh, truth telling and lying, between uh, sincerity and hypocrisy, and all those distinctions uh, become folded into politics as nothing but a simulacrum. Uh, nothing but a realm of fantasy, nothing but the realm uh, of, uh, of will uh, and uh, alternate facts. And what we might say is that what Arendt gives us is a pharmacon notion of lying in politics. Uh, but what I mean by that, and this is an old uh, platonic uh, idea of uh, 
uh, the relation between poison and cure, which uh, Derrida in particular made uh, uh, you know, available to us uh, in the 19, probably 80s or 90s. A pharmacon uh, is a question of dosage. In a small dose, a poison might serve to be a cure. In a large dose, it'll kill you. Uh, lying in a small dose, little lies, uh, half-truths, a spin, uh, opinions which are not based on absolute truth. All of that is, we might say, the life by the politics. A politics which turns uh, into the big lie uh, is like a pharmacon which is given into a larger dose and ends up killing us. So that what Arendt, I think, if we read her as um, not simply a truth teller who believes that even factual truth is the life of the politics, but rather as someone who uh, enlightens us about the necessary role of a certain amount of lying in politics, she gives us warrant for understanding the political realm uh, as inherently a realm, as she says at several points, uh, which is not uh, very favorable to the isolated role of the outside truth teller. Now, ironically, what this essay is trying to do uh, is to defend the role of the outside truth teller. At the very end of the essay, she says, look, uh, truth telling is essentially the role of the philosopher, the witness, uh, the reporter, uh, who is not in the political realm. And here she is, in a sense, this is an apologia for her role in uh, the Eichmann Jerusalem uh, controversy. She is reporting from the outside, and she's able to say, you know, fiat veritas, periad mundus. I will tell the truth no matter what. From within the political realm, uh, where uh, facts are uh, basically discussed, uh, they are mutually agreed upon, they are uh, intersubjectively verified, they're not something which is uh, isolated from the outside. From within the political realm, truth-telling is relativized in a way that she, I think, uh, leads us to understand. So she gives us, in a way, uh, I mean, this is why the essay is so complicated, almost a contradictory advice, that it is wise to be at a certain point outside uh, telling the truth, uh, being a reporter, being isolated, uh, allowing the world uh, to go under just so uh, truth can be told. That on the one hand, but also, and this is why she ends with that peroration to the glories of politics, also one should recognize that politics is a realm worth preserving. And if Hannah Arendt had any one great legacy, it was to elevate the political away from the idea that it was simply sordid uh, power uh, and uh, interest um, uh, gesturing and uh, uh, you know hunting for advantage, that was a realm of nobility, a realm of action, a realm of freedom, a realm of great deeds that would be remembered. And what is ironic is that the great deeds that would be remembered are often uh, intertwined with uh, action, which is intertwined with uh, the ability to think about what might be different, which is uh, in a way through a kind of affinity close uh, to opinion and close, ultimately, uh, to lying. So the irony of this essay is that it can be read, I think, in both directions. One, as a brief for truth-telling, but also as a recognition of the political realm is itself, to a certain extent, uh, a realm in which uh, lying is permitted. Now, just as a kind of footnote to this, she's constantly undercutting or at least uh, qualifying her argument. So she recognizes that the political realm, however isolated and uh, however boundaried it might be, is also permeable. And truth-telling uh, through judicial or scientific or scholarly practices can enter into uh, our deliberations in the political realm. So however much you might be talking about uh, an essential political realm, which is utterly and completely boundaried, she also recognizes that there is an interpenetration. Uh, and this is once again, one of the, the kind of, let's call it dialectical moments in Arendt, uh, setting off the political and yet showing it's not completely isolated, uh, trying to separate the political from the economic, the moral, uh, all other kinds of interests and so forth, and yet seeing the political as having within it these other uh, institutions like judiciary or the free press uh, or the academic community, which also uh, talk about uh, truth. So uh, I'm not sure this has been fully coherent, but the essay itself seems to me uh, a warrant for a kind of uh, response to the truth 
and or politics question, uh, which is one that is extraordinarily complicated uh, and involves a volatile semantic field. I haven't even really touched on all the ways we could talk about uh, questions of what we mean by the political, uh, as well as, of course, what we mean by truth. Uh, the essay has, and I've read it now, I don't know how many times, uh, always something new to teach us. Uh, and I'm anxious to hear what the panelists uh, have themselves taken from it and from the discussion uh, that will follow. So let me turn it back to you, Roger. Thank you, Marty. That's great. Um, I know it's pretty, pretty darn coherent. Um, this is, uh, as you said, an incredibly, I think this essay is often simplified, right? Uh, especially, you know, in popular things. And it, it's a complicated essay. And you really, um, I think, did a great job bringing that out. Um, and I thought it was wonderful how you started with, you know, how both Blumen, Blumenberg and, and Derrida sort of see her as on the side of truth. And yet it's clearly the case that at least within the political realm, she, uh, she's, an, she, she's an advocate of mendacity, at least to some degree. And I thought you did bring that out really well. I want to turn to the, to the end of the essay, which you, you sort of talked about at the end of your presentation. And, you know, where she says, look, we have to, we, politics is a glorious sphere and it's a sphere of, of action and, commu and being together and building things and fabricating. But politics needs to, have boundaries, right? And and the truth teller um, is one of those boundaries. And as as I'm sure you know, um, one of the uh, boundaries she talks about, she talks about law, she talks about philosophy, she talks about journalism. She says these are these are areas where the people who practice them, scientists, um, professors, have to be have to be truth tellers and not politicians. And when they break into politics and we break down that border, that boundary, um, that's when we lose the foundation uh, upon which, you know, we can have opinions. Because as you said, the world of politics and world opinions is incredibly frail and, 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 and open to being destroyed. And what, she, what she's in a sense saying, as I understand the essay is, we need a foundation that we agree on outside of politics. And, you know, you and I both went to Berkeley or you teach at Berkeley, I went to Berkeley, um, you know, and I'm thinking about the whole movement to politicize the academy that, you know, we've, we've experienced. There's a very, you know, th this is a part of our end that I think a lot of people, at least in the modern academy today, don't accept that there should be this sort of boundary between an academic and a politician, that there should be, um, that we should keep these, these, these realms separate. And that if we don't, um, we lose the, the ground below us and the sky above us. We lose the factual world that, that can provide that kind of um, limit to political, uh, well, to totalitarianism, to, totalitarianism, to the big lie, as you called it. I'm wondering how you think that holds up and, and how we can, how we think about that today when the politicization of the academy is, is like mother's milk to most of our colleagues and students. Is that even a battle we can fight anymore or not? Well, I think, uh, let, me, let me pick up the issue of foundation, which I think is extremely interesting, um, both uh, in terms of what is outside politics, uh, foundations in say these scholarly or other disciplines of truth telling. That on the one hand and politics uh, itself needing a foundation. Arendt, remember, in On Revolution, praises the American uh, rather than the French example, precisely because we've created uh, a constitution which in some ways provides a check on, let's say, the volatile politics uh, of the moment, the politics uh, of uh, a full democracy based on uh, legislative will at this particular moment, that there is, in other words, a foundation against which we measure the whims, the uh, passions of the present. And so there is a kind of dialectic between what is given, what is solid, what uh, exists as a foundation, whether it be the facts in this essay, um, the facts which are the facts of the past, or the constitution, which is also something in the past, which we look to as a check uh, on uh, a pure po political will in the present. 
So there is within the political realm itself a kind of dialectic of what we might call agency, action, future orientation, and will on the one hand, and the break of uh, maybe tradition or uh, constitutional uh, legal constraints or whatever on the other. So that there is a dialectic which occurs within politics, but also, as you correctly say, outside. So all of these uh, differentiations are differentiations which perhaps function in useful ways, differentiation be between, say, politicization and uh, disinterestedness, or between partisanship uh, and a kind of uh, above the fray neutrality. Now, like all distinctions, and this is uh, you know, a point that I think Arendt performatively instantiates in this essay, but other people have made it clear elsewhere, like all distinctions, they need to be both construed and denied. That boundaries are also, in a sense, membranes, that they are porous, and that it's possible to, uh, in a way, both have a boundary and recognize that it can be breached, that it's possible to see boundaries as historical rather than natural, as uh, available for negotiation. So the relationship between these scholarly or judicial uh, or seemingly disinterested realms and the interested value-oriented realm of politics, this is a boundary that is there both to be maintained and also under certain circumstances to be challenged. And I can't give you a kind of formula to say when that should happen, but we recognize sometimes it can happen too quickly. Uh, for example, the, in the United States now, the Supreme Court is in danger of being construed as overly political and is not representing a kind of disinterested uh, version of judicial constraint because of the fact that it was so loaded by, uh, by the previous president with the conservatives who you know, are about to over, overturn Roe v. Wade and so forth. So that there is a way in which we understand politicization can be a problem. Uh, and yet, you know, we also recognize that the uh, veneer of neutrality can be itself a kind of screen behind which other political interests play a role, that sometimes you know, what seems to be utterly above the fray is in fact really part of the fray uh, failing to identify itself as, as such. So these are, are ways to conceptualize the back and forth, we might say, of foundations and newness uh, or innovation, disinterestedness and partisanship, uh, facts and values, all the types of things that are in play uh, in uh, Arendt's thought, uh, which is itself so rich because she doesn't ever come to rest. Uh, that, you know, she's on the side of all of these issues, as I said before with On Revolution, on the side of foundations, and elsewhere she's on the side of a kind of activist isonomy uh, in which, you know, something like the workers' councils are an example. So Arendt is, a, I think, a very good uh, guide, we might say, to the uh, volatility of all of these uh, distinctions, even as she helps us to understand that distinctions are necessary as part of thinking uh, about uh, politics and life in general. I think that's, that's right. I think the, the connection you make between the Constitution as a foundation and a kind of factual world as a foundation as two different kind of limits on politics is, is helpful. I mean, one of the things that I think is is really prescient but also scary in this essay is her real sense that we are on the verge of what you say is sort of moving from the pharmacon the small lies that are the lifeblood of politics to the big lie and obviously she had lived through one version of that in, in, in Nazi Germany she wrote about Bolshevism in Russia um, you know and she, she's filled with she fills the essay with things where she says things like Facts have a slim chance of surviving the onslaught of power, right? On page 227 in the, in the edition that most of us have. And it says facts can be tabooed on 232. And on 255, she says, truth or facts has a strength of its own, but it can be destroyed. And once it's destroyed, it can't be replaced. So I'm wondering, you know, we're all sort of look, read, we read something like this today and we, we look at truth around us being destroyed. I mean, you know, cynicism taking over and this sense that everyone has that there are simply no facts, whether it's the Supreme Court or whether it's, you know, COVID science or environmental science or take what you will. You know, are you, are you of the opinion that we're 
seeing the destruction of a common world that can't be replaced? Or how do you read that? Well, this is, uh, you know, obviously a question of speculation and uh, judgment rather than uh, certainty. Uh, I mean, I think tendentially we have um, increased our anxiety over the erosion of truth. Uh, and when I wrote that book uh, on uh, the Burson Mendacity, I begin by saying that I was interested in this question, not during the uh, the presidency of George Bush, when everybody was attacking him for uh, having lied about weapons of mass destruction, getting us into the war in Iraq, but rather when Clinton was president, when he was accused by uh, Christopher Hitchens and others of being uh, a liar. So the question of lying uh, and the accusation that politicians lie uh, and that we're in danger of uh, you know, falling prey to the big lead, this has been around for a very long time. Now, the Trump presidency, of course, was extraordinary. And, uh, you know, luckily so, I hope. That is to say, out of the ordinary in its uh, blatant willingness to lie. But, of course, there was a tremendous pushback. And I think we now are extremely sensitive to the ways in which uh, the fact-checking uh, of lies and the distortions produced by big lies um, are a threat. So there is, I would say, uh, a real understanding of the power of uh, rumor, the power of conspiracy theories, the power of uh, kind of panic thinking to destroy the capacity to distinguish between uh, lies and truth. So I'm not quite as, I would say, apocalyptically pessimistic about where we're going with this. But having said that, it's also true that uh, the importance of situating, contextualizing facts in narrative. She even talks about storytelling uh, in meaningfulness rather than simply uh, objective uh, empirical realities. All this makes us recognize that when we uh, are engaged, especially in politics, there is always the intervention of uh, the non-factual and that we can't fall back on uh, simply getting the facts right as a way to make political decisions, uh, as a way to vote for a particular politician or fight for a cause. So as a result, we're engaged in questions, as she would tell us, of judgment, uh, questions which involve uh, the ability to uh, think, uh, which is not simply the ability to accept the dead weight of an empirical fact. Uh, so there's something that goes beyond simply the question of the truth of facts that makes politics uh, both dangerous and also an opportunity for change in a good direction. Uh, so I think to that extent, the question of truth and the question of uh, the big lie needs to be itself contextualized in the larger, let's say, policy questions, the larger questions of uh, problems that need to be solved, the larger questions of how uh, we deal with existential issues like climate change and so forth, which... Um, are, are somehow not reducible to the question of whether or not facts uh, are uh, solid and everybody agrees. Now, just to make one final point, Arendt has a tendency to think of politics in terms of acting in concert. Power is acting in concert. So the telos of politics is ultimately a kind of consensus, at least she seems to argue that at one point. Elsewhere, she argues, and this is the argument of pluralism, that politics is agonistic not antagonistic, a la Carl Schmitt, not friend enemy, but agonistic, competitive. Uh, and it, there is no ultimate consensus. The politics is adversarial. Politics always involves different values, different interests, always involves different narratives, always involves a sense of competition. Now, it's a competition which can lead ultimately to one side destroying the others, oppressing the other, or a competition which is peaceful and allows you know, the transfer of power and so forth after one side loses. But it is essentially not consensual. It is dissensual. And a politics of dissensus will never be able to agree on uh, even the factual basis of its opinions, uh, because those facts are always, as I said earlier, under description. And those descriptions are always, to a certain extent, mediated by current values, narratives, uh, and the meaning that we give to them. So, uh, uh, it's hard to know where to come out on this. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm a kind of Habermasian at heart, that consensus is a good telos for politics, but dissensus is a much more realistic way to understand what the political realm has been and for the foreseeable future will be, and in fact, maybe in a healthy way should be 
because it avoids the coercive quality that consensus might involve it was, if it would be, it would be a consensus about truth as opposed to uh, the variety of opinion. So, I mean, I think you've hit, I'm just, the, I'll, I'll ask one more question and I'm gonna open it up to the panel. I think you've hit on something really important when you say that, that politics about agreement and also disagreement. It's about dissensus and consensus. And I think that's right for our end. Of course, figuring out what that means is always harder than saying the general. But, um, you know, she says that, that truths are self-evident when Jefferson says it is to make an agreement. And where does that agreement come from? I mean, where does that, um, you know, she talks at the very last line of the essay, which is one of my favorite lines of Arendt, you know, conceptually, we may call truth what we cannot change. Metaphorically, it is the ground on which we stand and the sky that stretches above us. And of course, we can change it. And the ground on which we stand changes over time and let pace. So does the sky. But what it, it's, it's, that, it's that sort of foundation that you talked about before, whether it's the constitution or whether it's sort of the, the disinterested facts. And what she says in a number of places later in her life is that you can't make this happen, you can destroy it. But the only way to build it is from the ground up. She says, by talking to each other. And she says, talking about justice and piety can make the world more justice, more just and more pious. And I think it's in talking across our differences that even though you disagree and there's dissensus, you find certain things you agree on, right? And so this, this is then the last question I have is, you know, you said there's been a resistance to Trump, there's been a pushback to the, to the lying, the, the utter mendacity. And there's really been, but I think what's interesting is there's been two different approaches, right? There's one approach says we have to sort of try and be fair and tell the truth and, you know, understand where Trump's coming from and understand the critique, but not, not take a side, but try and reestablish a kind of center. And the other side says, no, we have to become part of the resistance. Um, part of the problem is there's still no agreement, I think, uh, on which side. I'm wondering where you would place Arendt and where you think the right place to go is in that way. Well, this is a hard one. I mean, uh, I, I absolutely agree that there are moments when you think uh, that um, the opponents uh, in this particularly polarized moment have to be treated strategically rather than communicatively. That is to say, we have to try to destroy and defeat them, marginalize them, undercut them in every way possible, uh, and not try to reason with them, not try to include them, not try to understand them. That's, that's one sort of, uh, you know, let's say, impulse that we have. The other impulse is to say, well, wait a minute, they have fears, they have anxieties that need to be dealt with, uh, that they've been uh, ridiculed, they've been uh, treated condescendingly by elites, that you know, all the, the reasons for taking them seriously rather than dismissing them as, say, authoritarian personalities who can never change, we have to destroy them. So I think, you know, we're really in a situation where both of these are temptations, and I'm not sure uh, a priori which one will get us out of our impasse. So I, I, I mean, my general feeling is that we should at least try to communicate and include rather than try to, uh, you know, be strategic simply because it'll backfire. And ultimately, by treating them as, say, pathological or, or as uh, the tools of other interests, we don't respect them as human beings. We simply see them uh, as uh, tools of something else. So I, I think that's my, my kind of, I don't know what, irenic impulse. But let me get back to the question of consensus, because I think it's extremely interesting. How is a consensus built? From a Habermasian point of view, and Arendt in a way is, uh, you know, in some respects, proto-Habermasian, it should be built by the better argument, by being able to reason, by being able to persuade through facts, through logic, uh, through evidence, and so forth. And assuming the other person is capable of listening and capable of coming to an agreement, which goes beyond an initial opinion. That's a very ideal version. Another version of consensus building is through compromise in which we understand that our interests are different, but all right, I'm gonna give a little, you're gonna give a little, I'm not gonna be convinced that you're right, but we're gonna to come to this. A third way to produce a consensus is through a kind of what I would call tacit mendacity. And politics, even in democracies, often work this way. That is to say, coalitions are built uh, through a kind of, uh, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge about what I really believe and what I'm gonna, you know, say in public. Uh, so, for example, uh, in 
a primary campaign, uh, opponents will call each other the worst names and argue that the person who is on the opposite side of the fence gets in, all hell will break loose. After that person wins the nomination for your party, then suddenly they become heroes and you forget all the nasty things you've said. The great example I always give uh, of this is the allies in World War II. Uh, when Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt got together uh, to fight uh, Hitler and the Japanese, uh, they overcame all types of uh, suspicions, all types of uh, true beliefs about uh, the interests of the other party. After the war ended and the Cold War broke out, these, of course, came to the fore. So politics often involves a kind of hypocrisy when it comes to building coalitions. And democracy is based not only on the consensus of the better argument, not only on compromise, but also on a certain level, we might say, uh, a meta level of knowledge about the necessity of strategic mendacity. Um, and these are all ways in which we can perhaps build coalitions to get something done rather than end up with uh, stasis, fragmentation, gridlock, uh, which uh, prevents anything from getting done. Uh, so those are you know, very general answers to I, questions that I think we're all struggling with. I think that's great. And I would just add one other, I think Arendt would agree with all three of those. She's, she's, she believes somewhat in persuasion, but she also believes in, in those little mendacities. But also you mentioned earlier hypocrisy. I mean, for her, there's a, a absolute element of hypocrisy in politics. I'm going to bring in the panel now. Also, for those who are in the webinar, not on our panel, you can um, ask a question in the Q&A function, and I will try and bring those in to the discussion as well. But for our panelists, um, just raise your hand when you have a question or break in if you feel so the need. But uh, let me start with Lindsay, who's had her hands up for a little while. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Marty. That was so helpful. And, and, uh, and Lindsay, could you, and this is for all the panelists, could you just briefly introduce yourselves to everyone so we all have a sense of where we are? Okay, hi, I, I'm Lindsay Stonebridge. I'm a professor of humanities and human rights, University of Birmingham, and I write a lot on current. Um, I wonder if we can go back to um, storytelling. And um, I was fascinated by what you were saying about future storytelling um, as part of politics. And as I was looking at this essay again, I was struck again by the last passage, which Roger's already read. Conceptually, we may call truth what we cannot change, semicolon. Metaphorically, it's the ground on which we stand in the sky that stretches above us. That is a quotation almost from Walter Benjamin's essay on the storyteller, where he opens that amazing essay saying, you know, in the, in the first decades of the 20th century, everything has changed economics, economically, technically, in terms of the development of capitalism. And you have the small figure of man standing, standing there on the ground. And the only things that are the same are the ground he stands on and the sky above him. So I read her, that is, that is, that is a homage to Walter Benjamin. And it's an homage to the power of storytelling. She also says metaphorically, and I think that ground she's talking about, the ways you've explained, is very much about common sense. Um, and very much about, you know, if you lose the ground of common sense, you can't have any kind of, you know, agonistic or consensual or decentral politics because you, 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 you're not sharing that ground. But what I thought was really interesting about what you said is her, her concept of facts in this essay is very much like historical facts. It's looking back. And it, when I was rereading the essay this afternoon, it puzzled me that, Facts are historical, but hardly anywhere does she talk about events or natality. I don't think she does talk to me. I think she does a little bit, but hardly anywhere. And I was sort of thinking, well, what's the relationship between a fact and an event? Because an event in her end is almost sheer contingency. I mean, she really doesn't want events to be able to be plotted because then you're in trouble. So you have this kind of stubborn facts and the contingency of events. And then, uh, I mean, in the other thing I was trying to think of is where does this essay fit in terms of the collection? This seems to be a very much an essay, even though it's sort of drenched with um, its historical moment and questions about lying, is looking looking back, but isn't actually making or isn't hasn't found the terms to articulate the future telling that that you were beginning to talk about. 
So well, those, a lot, lot of throwing there. But just talk to me more about storytelling. <laughs> those are terrific questions. I mean, first of all, the storyteller, uh, once again, the temporality is interesting. One could argue that we tell stories about the past. We tell it from a kind of Minerva's Owl perspective. We know how it comes out. We know how ironies produce unintended consequences. We implot the story a la Hayden White in terms of various tropological uh, narrative uh, patterns. We understand stories, in other words, as finished. Politics is precisely the place in which stories are in media race. A story is not yet over. We, we don't know what's going to happen uh, with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we're in the middle of that. Uh, and so politics involves, in a sense, telling a story which has not yet been uh, finished uh, or trying to tell a story which will be finished in the future. But uh, we can only uh, maybe hope or fear what the end will be. So uh, it seems to me the storyteller as a model of what it means to be in politics uh, is only partially correct, because the stories that we're in the middle of are stories in which we're not simply external observers, but also we might say participants. We are the protagonists of the story. The other question, of course, about anything that has to do with a narrative is focalization. That is to say, from whose point of view is the story told? Uh, the victims, uh, the victors, uh, the people who are martial, the people who are passive, the people who are forgotten. So storytelling is only, we might say, as valid uh, as the storyteller uh, has a kind of authority to tell the story, but that is always partial. So storytelling becomes, in a sense, part of the general mix of political opinion, because storytelling, uh, there's no omniscient narrator, we might say, about human history, and certainly about uh, the political stories which we're now uh, creating or being created around us. Now, the issue of the event is absolutely fascinating. And I, I've written quite a bit, actually, recently about the idea of the event in recent French thought. And there are lots of extremely, uh, I would say, almost hysterical accounts of the importance of the event as a rupture, uh, as a break uh, in uh, narrative storytelling, as something which happens unprepared, which is the intervention of the impossible and what seemed to be possible, as something which is like natality, it introduces something absolutely new in the world. Uh, and the Heideggerian notion of Ereignis, which is important, I think, for uh, Arendt, is also important for the French thinkers who see the event in these terms. So the event is something which is utterly contingent in the sense that it's not fully prepared. So it is something which breaks through, we might say, the narrative uh, arc of a story which seems to be going in a particular direction. Now, this could be a disaster, 9-11 is a kind of event, or it could be something that is a positive rupture. It's the uh, emergence of something which was unanticipated, but which has the potential to change things for the good. But whatever it is, it is not something which can be folded back into the narrative context, the stories that we're telling, the ways in which we understand uh, where we've come from. It introduces something which is utterly different. And this seems to me something that Arendt, with the idea of natality, is very sensitive to. Uh, and it goes against that fairly conservative notion of the facts as can't be changed and truth telling is somehow beholden to uh, the solidity of a factual world, which is, uh, you know, unamenable to action. So uh, here, once again, we find in her resources for very different readings, very different uh, conclusions that we could take from all of these extremely, uh, you know, difficult questions. Thanks. I just want to... Um chime in with a, a thought about the other part of Lindsay's question, which was where it stands in the collection. Um, uh, and we didn't mention it, but the, the, the opening sort of footnote uh, at the beginning of the essay says that the essay really was um, written in response to the Eichmann in Jerusalem controversy. And, and she says uh, that there were two issues. One is, did I always believe it right to tell the truth, fiat veritas peret mundus, which um, Marty had talked about and i think the answer as marty explained it is as a as a person yes or as an expert yes or as a scientist yes but not as a politician right and 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 maybe not as a friend <laughs> although that's an interesting question do you always tell the truth as a friend but the second issue was um she says um the amazing amount of lies used in the controversy and and the question of what do you make of that 
And she says the following reflections try to come to grips with both issues. They serve as an example of what happens to a highly topical subject, namely, I think, truth and lying, uh, when they're drawn into the gap between past and future, which is the per perhaps the proper habitat of all reflections. And so this is a, explicitly an attempt to think about what does it mean to think in that battleground of past and future about the problem of truth. And Marty, do you want to add anything? Well, it's interesting. My, my, my copy of uh, Between Past and Future Goes Back, I bought this so many years ago, that did not have that essay. This was the 1961 edition. So the essay, in a way, is an addendum. Uh, it clearly was added by the editors later on. And as you say, it, 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 she mentions Between Past and Future, but it isn't quite on the same register. It has that uh, you know, apologia for her own particular interventions uh, in the Eichmann case uh, as um, something that uh, really motivated it. Uh, but of course, it does draw on many other, uh, you know, issues that she raises in all of her work. So, I mean, Arendt is, a, 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 if you have to sort of think of Arendt as a proper name, uh, which we uh, affix to lots of different works over time, including ones that were not published, for example, letters uh, that, you know, ultimately came out. Th this is a remarkably uh, complicated trajectory with lots of uh, twists and turns, just for example, on the question of Zionism or uh, her attitudes, uh, you know, towards, uh, uh, say, racial politics in the United States, the recent book uh, by, uh, is it uh, Gina Kine, is that her name, uh, on uh, Arendt and the Negro question or Arendt and Black politics, whatever the exact title is. I mean, she, she went through many different uh, problematic phases in her life. So I would say that between past and future, in some ways, uh, you know, we can say each of her own essays hovers in that uh, gap between her own past and the future that she had not yet written in her own work, and also in the reception of that work. Um, one of the things that's fascinating me about the phenomenon that we associate with the proper name Hannah Arendt is the ferocity of her critics, uh, including people like Adorno and Isaiah Berlin, who absolutely despised her who thought she was utterly and completely worthless, uh, on the one hand, and others uh, who have found in her extraordinary um, inspiration. that She's been a lightning rod for lots of different interpretations. Uh, and this essay, I think, captures uh, you know, some of the reasons why, because there's, there's such a kind of active richness in the thought uh, that it doesn't quite fit with the other essays and yet could be added to them. Uh, it moves us into new territories. It is partly motivated by uh, the moment uh, uh, of its origin, the Eichmann and Jerusalem controversy, and yet extends and transcends beyond it. Uh, so she's she's a figure, you know. She her metaphor of thinking without banisters is very nice. I think that you know she, in a sense, is not really a banister for us. She she moves us forward, but it's a, a, a rickety staircase. Uh, you know, we have to be careful about uh, places that are holes that we might fall through. But it's a staircase that is worth uh, the risk of, tra uh, of traversing because of all that you can get uh, by so doing. Thanks. Um, Margo, you're up next. And then I see Barry, you are up. you'll be up after that. Margo, I can't hear you. I don't know if other people can. Um, no. You're not muted, but can you speak closer to the microphone? Oh, you can hear my voice? But you can't yeah, make there you go. Okay. Okay. Um, Margo, I'm afraid I can't. Margo, Margo there's still, it's still not coming through. I mean, I don't know. There's something wrong with your microphone, it seems. It goes in and out. Um, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> Yeah, put, put it in the chat and I'll um and I'll ask it then. I apologize. Um, Barry, go ahead. You have to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, Roger. I I wanted to see if you or uh, Professor Jay could talk a little bit more about the issue that you brought up about the uh, supposed politicization of the academy, and probably the same is true of journalism and so on. These realms that are supposed to be somewhat insulated from the political 
realm. And um, uh, I just thought that needs a little bit more unpacking because for instance, when Arendt writes as a journalist in the New Yorker about the Eichmann uh, question, she's, she's intervening in the political realm from outside of the political realm. She's not working as a politician, she's working as a different uh, kind of thinker and actor. And, um, you know, I think that there's uh, a tendency uh, to overlook the fact that people outside the political realm uh, nonetheless act politically. And uh, isn't it the case somehow that uh, uh, to, uh, to pretend to uh, the kind of neutrality of these other realms is in itself uh, sometimes a form of, of falsehood? Marty, you want to? Well, uh, you know, I, I absolutely agree that uh, the boundary between acting politically and being allegedly uh, neutral is a boundary that's easily permeated. I think that we also have to think about the valence that we put on the notion of politicization. Usually, when we say, oh, that's being politicized, what we mean is that it has been made a partisan uh, and interest oriented uh, question rather than a neutral and disinterested one. And we therefore feel that to politicize something is to uh, to denigrate, to lower it, uh, to make it into something which uh, it shouldn't be. That uh, it should be neutral. That we shouldn't have scholarship politicized. We shouldn't have advocacy in the classroom and so forth. Arendt gives us a much more, we might say, heroic version of politics. Uh, a politics as a realm of freedom, as a realm of action, as a realm of interaction between people, as a world creating. Uh, realm uh, of the betweenness of people rather than the isolation uh, of the individual mind. In other words, her version of politicization, we might say, is not one which reduces it to negative partisanship, but elevates it into something which is uh, perhaps the most noble thing that humans can do. It's better than labor. It's better than work. It's better than the household. I mean, one can argue she's wrong about that, but at least that's her version of it. So that when we say something is being politicized from an Arendtian point of view, it's not to denigrate it, but to elevate it. And I think that's that's an interest. Now, having said that, it is also true that politicization can mean those other bad things. And, you know, we know that, uh, you know, politics sometimes means simply being interested in your own power, in your own advantage, in your own, uh, you know, basic uh, triumph for reasons that are uh, not so noble. So we have to, I think, be aware of the political as itself contested terrain. Now, having said that, the world of uh, the academy or of science or uh, of the judiciary, whatever world uh, in the, uh, the world of journalism, which we see as somehow pristine, uh, once again, a boundary is a membrane. And so there's always some way in which uh, the uh, as you correctly said, the position of alleged neutrality above the fray, of being completely and totally transcendent, is often one that we could show to be uh, a, an ideological screen, that you can pull down the person and show, no, in fact, they are rooted in the world. And one of the lessons, we might say, of uh, the critique of Eurocentrism, of uh, white male supremacy, all these things have shown us that what we assume to be simply uh, ideas or arguments were in fact also expressions, expressions of a standpoint, expressions of a positionality, expressions of an interest. Now, this doesn't mean that they're nothing but that. I mean, I would very much oppose that position. But on the other hand, it gives us, and this is why this book that I recently on Genesis and Validity tries to argue intellectual history is a place where this has been staged, gives us a sense of how transcendence and genesis, how uh, somehow being disinterested and being positioned are uh, in a kind of complicated uh, relationship, which uh, can't simply be reduced one uh, to one or the other. Uh, and I think all of those allegedly non-political realms, therefore, are in a complicated way, imbricated with, intertwined with, entangled with, but not reducible to, the other realms. Uh, differentiation, yes, de-differentiation, uh, also possible. Uh, 
the value of differentiation, yes, but also the necessity of thinking how things fit together uh, as an antidote to the sterility of absolute siloing uh, differentiation, which things are utterly completely apart. So it's a great question because it involves so many different, uh, I think, really vexing issues. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I, I'll, 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 I'll put it this way, Barry, because um, I generally, I think, agree with, with Marty, but maybe with slight different valences. There's two sides of this question, right? If, if, if Arendt is trying to put up a barrier or what I think Marty rightly calls a membrane, which is permeable uh, between politics and some sort of outside, um, on the other, on one side is, you know, the question you asked about Barry about, you know, well, isn't, isn't scholarship always political, right? This is the, the critique. And, and the answer of course is gonna be to some degree, yes. Um, there's always gonna be interests that any particular person, a scholar has based on their politics, based on their background, based on their prejudices, et cetera. Um, and yet, just like Marty said something about, there's the little lies, which are the lifeblood of politics, and then there's the big lie. Yeah, we all have interests, and we should be able to be critical of those interests and self-critical of interests, and we should be able to argue. Um, and yet, when scientists or journalists or lawyers or judges uh, become advocates, right? It's not just that they are they have differences, right? When you, when you engage in a march for science and scientists go on it, it politicizes what they're doing and it makes what they say um, susceptible to, to, to critique in a, in a much more um, visceral way. And you lose, uh, um, Arendt thinks, when you do that, you lose the right to be taken seriously as a truth teller. And when we have no truth tellers left, when everyone is seen to be political, um, we lose that possibility for consensus, for that common ground, the common ground and the common sky. Um, and so that's the danger on the one side, right? Which is not to say that there's, that everyone's objective. Arendt doesn't believe in objectivity. She does believe in impartiality though, right? And there's a difference. Objectivity is to think that you have some access to some undisinterested truth. There is no such thing. But impartiality means that you're not an advocate. You're actually trying to say something true with, of course, your interests, but then people can at least argue and be critical and make those issues aware. On the other side, on the political side, what she's really worried about is that we stop thinking about politics as about persuasion and of opinions and the clash of opinions and start thinking, oh, there are some experts who tell us what to do, whether it's in COVID or, or, or in, in, in global warming or whatever. And we say that there are certain people, these scientists uh, or these, these, you know, these scientists in these cases uh, who know better than us and will tell us what to do. And we trade what she calls politics for something like expert governance. And, and when that happens, um, uh, again, that boundary is, 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 is is, is crossed. And, and these people are claimed to have some expertise in what we should do. And she says, no, they don't have any expertise in what they should do. They have expertise in maybe how the problem emerged or the history of it or the science of it, but on what we should do, there's no experts. That's a political question. And so she's very worried about the loss of, on the one hand, um, uh, factual truth tellers, and on the other hand, uh, the idea of um, uh, those who will engage in, in politics on the level of opinion, which she thinks has no scientific uh, expertise necessary. Um, Marty, is that, do you want to respond to any of that or is that well, okay? That also opens up an enormously interesting uh, series of questions. I mean, obviously democracy involves uh, an expectation that citizens are well enough informed to engage uh, in political deliberation and come out with a consensus that will uh, involve a la Arendt the enlarged consciousness that will take into account other positions. We know, of course, that this is an ideal version of democracy. Democracy uh, is, in reality, a question, especially in a large polity of representation, that we give over, we might say, our own vote, our own voice uh, to people that we select as representatives, and we hope that they will be 
experts enough and have the right values to represent our positions as best as possible. And then we also, under certain circumstances, even defer to non-elected, non-representative figures who are called experts. Now, the most obvious current example of this is uh, the debate over masks and vaccinations in the United States and probably elsewhere around the world, in which uh, the pushback against expertise the pushback of uh, everybody should decide for him or herself has led to what in many respects is a disaster. That is to say, uh, a refusal to be vaccinated, a refusal to wear masks simply because uh, the experts are now discredited. Uh, and this happens not only from you know, people who are, I don't know what, religiously or otherwise inclined, but also from people like uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who uh, will argue that uh, the experts are part of a kind of conspiracy of biopower, a la Foucault, uh, to control uh, through governmentality uh, a population which is docile. And so he's against uh, the uh, intervention of the state uh, in uh, trying to deal with COVID, kind of nutty position. So we're really in a very, I would say, fluid situation when it comes to believing in experts, believing in uh, science, or believing in something that uh, is not uh, what we ourselves can uh, reasonably claim uh, knowledge about, that on the one hand, and also being, uh, in a sense, justifiably suspicious of the rule of, of experts, of the rule of the wise, of the rule of philosopher kings. And democracy is a, a kind of constant struggle between our uh, let's say, vain attempts to be fully uh, informed, and yet the necessity to be active participants rather than passive acceptors of the expertise of others. And there's no formula in advance which says which we, we should go in a complex society. Uh, so I think we're constantly faced with uh, the abuse of power and those we trust, and then on the other hand, the ignorance of those who claim to have uh, the um, authority to judge without having any expertise whatsoever. So it's a very uh, volatile situation. I think the uh, surprising resistance to uh, mandates and to vaccinations uh, and to mask wearing shows how complicated it can become uh, in the current world where trust in experts, uh, trust in those who represent us has been eroded. I'm gonna just take a, I think this is a fascinating uh, discussion. I'm gonna respond a little bit if that's okay, because. I think Marty and I disagree a little here, both on our end and, and, and on, on Agumbin. Um, you know, I think that Agumbin's point was not a conspiracy, as far as I understand it. And I've been teaching his essays on this for a little while now during the pandemic. It was that there are other values besides um, public health that we have in the world, right? Including religion. Uh, including uh, hugging people, including uh, taking care of the sick and your relatives, um, going to funerals, and that um, we shouldn't, and that how we decide to respond to a pandemic um, is a political question of where values do we set higher? Is it life or is it other values like uh, meaning and uh, care for your relatives and friendship and love. And in this case, Arendt and Gumbin, I think, offer a similar caution, which is that we should be wary of putting what Arendt would call labor, uh, uh, homo laborans, the, the laboring or life animal above all others, and there are other values. But what she really says is that the danger is giving over that deeply political, meaningful engagement with who we are as a people to scientists or experts who may be very good at telling us how, vex how diseases are transmitted or how vaccines stop them or also may be wrong about that for many reasons, but are not so good at telling us what's most important in the life. And, um, and that's uh, one of the confusions between um, fact and politics that I think, think she's warning against. I don't know if that, find, if you find that at all convincing or wrong, Marty. Well, you know, it's, it, I think it's a rough question to really deal with. I mean, my, my feeling is that there is a difference between mere life and the good life. 
uh, between uh, you know Zoe and Bios in Aristotle sense. But without life, mere life, we can't have a good life. Uh, so that although the other values are, I think, uh, you know, worth taking seriously, uh, if people are dying and that people are uh, subjected to uh, the increased likelihood they will die because of a lack of uh, solidarity in the public health realm, those other values uh, can't really ultimately be sustained. It's not an equal balance that uh, to this extent, life becomes uh, an absolute. Uh, you can't have freedom unless you're alive. Uh, you can't have love unless you're alive. You can't have all the things that a Agamben feels are worth taking seriously and maybe aren't as well, uh, unless you're alive. So it's not so much animal aberrance that's being defended, it's the mere capacity to survive. And this is a capacity which is endangered by uh, a kind of rebellion against uh, publicly agreed upon, scientifically endorsed measures. It's not as if the scientists are a minority. Uh, the scientists are basically now, I would say, accepted by a vast majority of people who have been inoculated and uh, who understand the necessity of wearing masks. So it's really a small minority. It's a kind of human rights versus uh, political uh, majority argument. The political majority is on the side of scientists, uh, whereas only a small minority, the Agamben to Taylor, uh, Tucker Carlson minority, uh, who uh, you know, are suspicious of the efforts of the scientists and of governments to try to keep us healthy. So I must say, I, I, I was disappointed in Agamben. I, I took the argument that Jean-Luc Nancy made against him, that you, know, you have to really sometimes take science seriously, and it's better to have, you know, the heart surgery, the heart transplant that Agamben uh, maybe didn't take seriously, but that Nancy said saved his life, uh, that one has to sometimes accept what the scientists, the doctors tell us and, and not assume that they're being, uh, you know, self-interested or trying to, through governmentality, rule us or I don't know what. Yeah. But, but this is a slightly different argument from the argument about Arendt. I mean Arendt was certainly no fan of, of human rights, or at least his life as a human right. But um, I want to bring up uh, Margot's question, which she couldn't say before, but she's written in, which goes to this, which is, she says that, what, what would Hannah Arendt have made of the daily press conferences that Trump gave during the height of COVID when he surrounded himself with experts and allowed some of them to speak? Were all of these people compromised by being there? Um, with the possible exception of Dr. Fauci, or did some of them manage to stand up for factual truth? I don't know what you, if you have a thought on that, Marty. Well, I think it's an excellent question. I mean, it has to do with the framing, we might say, the contextualization uh, of the communicative acts of scientists or of doctors or of experts in general. So they're always to some extent framed by, uh, let's call it the context of legitimation. Uh, that they're given authority, for example, if they have credentials uh, in the scientific world, a PhD or an MD, or if they're members of esteemed universities, or if they're members of academies. In other words, there is a kind of credentialing uh, that takes place, which allows scientists to gain uh, respect, trust, and authority. Uh, now, this is then also uh, displaced onto the political realm, so that we have some scientists who are given the cachet of being government officials, uh, and we sometimes take them more seriously, but also because we know governments have their own interests, we become suspicious of them as mouthpieces for uh, a governmental uh, position, which is not fully uh, indifferent to uh, you know, the, the interests of the government. So that I think uh, it's, it's really quite a striking example of the, the scientists, the uh, physicians, the medical experts who were made to, in a way, either accept what Trump was arguing or through complicated gestures and uh, subtle hints show that they disagreed with it. And it created, of course, great theater. I mean, Trump finally gave up giving those press conferences because he was so ridiculed. Uh, and it was so clear that he was making the scientists around him, Fauci and Burks and others, uh, so uncomfortable by the idiocy of some of his pronouncements. But it's a good example of the entanglement of the political uh, with the scientific or the expert, that uh, there's always some context, a uh, context of authority, context of legitimation, context which means that science is never completely above uh, every fray. 
Uh, what we saw there was it being dragged down into a particularly blatant context, in which Trump is trying to manipulate things for his own uh, purposes. And you saw how uncomfortable it made them, and some of them, like Fauci, ultimately spoke out. But uh, I mean, it's always a, you know, j just to give a, a, a kind of a sort of a slightly athwart uh, argument. It's always interesting whether or not you feel you can change things from within a corrupt government or corrupt system, or have to break with it, or have to be an outsider. And once you become an outsider, you lose any authority you might have to change from within. And so those scientists more or less thought they could change from within, and they didn't want to abdicate their responsibility, uh, even though they were in a situation where they were to some extent compromised by their association uh, with Trump. Uh, some of them, of course, did break later, and some of Trump's uh, officials have broken with him. But uh, it's not an a priori decision whether or not you can change things better from within or from the outside, whether or not you should become an outsider and break dramatically and then lose uh, position of authority. Uh, I have no answer to that one. Can, can I add something here uh, yeah. about this, uh, which is that it would also be interesting to uh, mirror Trump's uh, daily press conferences with the, the daily broadcast that New York's Governor Cuomo was making uh, at that point, where he was presenting himself as the, uh, the, the man of fact and uh, the one who was really just in a kind of commonsensical way, uh, giving, giving the hard truth and telling it like it is and so on. And uh, yet in retrospect, we realized that he uh, was also manipulating uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, a situation of how um, uh, people in nursing homes were counted and dealt with. Uh, to his own political advantage. But in the moment, it seemed like something that was enormously uh, comforting, actually, to a lot of people to have a political figure of that stature uh, kind of taking this sort of position. Any, any, any comment on that? Well, I think it's a wonderful cautionary example that we you know, tend to dichotomize the political universe and we create villains and heroes. And certainly Cuomo for that brief moment, despite his past, which people in New York, I think were very sensitive to people elsewhere, perhaps less so, uh, he suddenly became, as you say, the truth teller, the, uh, the guy who's the responsible government uh, agent and so forth. And uh, you know, not only was he discredited uh, you know, for other reasons, having to do with his uh, you know, sexual transgressions, but also because of the way in which he manipulated the uh, data over the uh, nursing home. So you know, in a way, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a sad cautionary example of how we have to be a little bit less quick to heroize those who we assume uh, are the, uh, you know, the, the good actors. And, uh, no, it, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope it doesn't lead to cynicism because, I mean, I think uh, the example of someone we trusted uh, who had feet of clay uh, is always a sobering example. Uh, and the Cuomo saga, which seems with its brother's recent disgrace to have no end, uh, is very hard for us who found for a brief period of time, uh, both of them as, as, you know, fairly attractive alternatives to what we saw on the other side of the political universe. So. No, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's very sobering, really. Peter, you want to jump in quickly? You got to unmute yourself. Peter, you got to unmute. Yeah, I uh, just wanted because um, Martin, you talked about um, um, the essay, um, Hannah Arendt's essay, and the facts are situated in narrative, and I mean, made me think of. Um, uh, uh, sort of whistleblowers who are dealing with facts and you know five miles away from where I'm sitting Julian Assange is rotting in a jail in Belmarsh jail might be extradited to the states and and he was putting a whole lot of factual information onto the internet you know in uh, and we go back to Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers you know, those people, the, the, the fact that they're dealing with an enormous amount of facts is actually really dangerous to the powerful. Um, and it seems like, um, in a sense, they're not situated in a narrative. They, they're, they're situated outside the sort of narrative that Hannah 
Aaron was talking about. Just wondered what you thought about that. Well, you're absolutely right. This uh, comes back to the idea of the event is disrupting uh, narrative. So that occasionally the uh, revelation of a new fact, uh, of new evidence, of uh, some sort of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a document or an archival thing that has been previously overlooked will change the narrative, will interrupt the narrative, will create the possibility of new narratives. On the other hand, it's always possible for these new facts or events to be recuperated and uh, in some sense folded into a narrative or made the fodder for a slightly different but still, uh, let's say, problematic compensatory uh, legitimating narrative so that they don't always simply uh, disrupt in a kind of complete way and overturn the old narrative. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's, it's a little like uh, the, um, the ways in which the uh, Ptolemaic universe model uh, before the Copernican revolution could be adjusted, uh, could be uh, made to survive through the incorporation of new types of, uh, let's say, uh, contrivances to save the appearances uh, of uh, you know, the past until finally a moment was reached in which uh, the Copernican revolution said, no, no, the Ptolemaic version uh, of uh, a, a geocentric universe has to be uh, simply uh, completely undone. So facts uh, can sometimes lead to that, but they don't necessarily lead to that moment of rupture. And what produces a paradigm shift, what produces uh, a new narrative uh, is sometimes dependent on more than just the introduction of new facts, but also other, uh, you know, let's say uh, changes uh, like the change, uh, the famous uh, dialectical change from uh, quantity to quality when uh, water uh, becomes ice at 32 degrees. So that, you know, you end up with these um, complicated, uh, let's say, uh, mechanisms uh, of continuity, of uh, recuperation, and then suddenly of rupture, discontinuity, and uh, newness. And a priori, there's no way, I think, in which we can tell when the latter will occur. Uh, and so new facts can sometimes simply be absorbed into the old. And this is why narrative is so important. I mean, the great example in judicial terms in the United States 20 or so years ago was the Rodney King uh, you know, video in which yeah. we saw this, this poor guy being beaten. And yet somehow they were able in the court to create a narrative to uh, create doubt about what we were actually seeing. So the evidence of our eyes was... Uh, you know, somehow not enough to destroy the narrative of the police being, you know, basically uh, on the, uh, you know, the right and uh, his beating being somehow deserved. Uh, it didn't happen with uh, George Floyd, uh, although there was anxiety, it might. I mean, you remember, remember that trial, you know, uh, it came out the guy was, was accused was actually, uh, you know, ultimately found guilty. But even that video could have been, and people were nervous about it, like the Rodney King video, could have been a fact that was uh, reabsorbed into the old narrative. So it's really a, a, a great question. How do we you know, uh, change the narratives? Facts alone perhaps will be necessary, but insufficient to do that. No. There's a, oh, a beautiful adage that when you know you're having a great conversation when there's many people who want to speak and you're out of time. Um, we are past our time and there's a lot of questions. The narrative question from um, Andrea Timor, I think, I think Marty, you've you just even addressed again um, the question around bigness about power. Um, I think we've talked about it. power is, um, you know, there's a difference between power as collective action, and power as violence in our end, and, and we should keep that in mind. Um, and we have talked about the public health. I want to thank you all, and I want to especially thank uh, Marty J for for being here and leading us through uh, an incredibly rich and complicated essay with great uh, insight and poise. I'm going to turn it back over to Richard. Thank you again, Marty. My pleasure. Yeah, Marty, thank you very much. Really interesting. The, 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 the subject of COVID is worth a session all in on its own. Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, well, thank Marty. Thank Roger. And um, just to say that the, uh, the, the final reading group uh, will take place on the 3rd of uh, February. It will be live. We are no longer doing Zoom. Uh, well, of course, Zoom will be available but it will be the 3rd of February in London, Roger Berkowitz, uh, Lindsay Stonebridge. Um, and I hope as many people as possible will make it to London. 
Um, but of course, there'll still be Zoom for those who can't. Uh, so um, look forward to seeing you all um, in London. Roger, Marty, Marty, thank you very much again. Wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you all for the great questions. Thank you.